Welcome to Clinical Minute. Brian is an 18-year-old African-American male who presents to your university health clinic with complaints about bumps around his anus that seem to be getting worse. You notice he is very shy and seems embarrassed to discuss his symptoms. Brian is a college freshman who lives on campus in a dorm suite and works part-time as a waiter. He has no significant health history and is not currently taking any medications. He reports occasional alcohol use with his friends and reports no tobacco or recreational drug use. As part of the intake, you tell Brian that you would like to ask him some questions about his sexual history. You acknowledge that these questions can sometimes be a bit uncomfortable or embarrassing, but that you ask them of all your patients once a year to help you provide the best care possible. You also assure him that all health information he shares with you is confidential. He nods his head and agrees to answer questions. You know that in busy healthcare practices, it is not uncommon for providers to skip the sexual history unless a patient has signs or symptoms of sexually transmitted infections, or STIs. Learning about the sexual health and behavior of patients is an important part of providing appropriate care and provides opportunities to educate and counsel patients about STIs and to determine tests or vaccinations that may be needed. Some providers prefer to start the conversation about patients' sexual histories with an open-ended request for information, such as, tell me about your sexual activity, or tell me about your sexual partners over the last year. Other providers prefer to use a model developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, called the 5 P's, Partners, Practices, Past History of STIs, Protection from STIs, and pregnancy plans. You begin with the questions about partners. These questions are, are you currently sexually active or are you having sex? If the patient answers no, consider asking if he or she has ever been sexually active. In the past 12 months, how many sex partners have you had? Are your sex partners men, women, or both? If a patient answers both, repeat the first two questions for each specific gender. In response to these questions, Brian responds that he has had sex with two men in the last year and only has sex with men. Based on his initial answers, you go on to ask selected questions from the 5 P's model. But first, you let him know that your questions are going to get a bit more explicit about the kind of sex he has. You ask Brian about whether he has oral or anal sex, and whether he gives or receives for both. Brian says that he does give and receive oral sex. He says that he is always on the bottom for anal sex, which you know he means that he has receptive anal sex. Obviously, you do not ask Brian about vaginal sex. Based on his answers about practices, you ask selected questions about protection from STIs and testing history. Brian responds that he uses condoms sometimes and hasn't been tested for any STIs, including HIV. You tell Brian that you'd like to take a look at the bumps he found, and he nods yes, although he looks embarrassed. You conduct a visual examination and find evidence of external anal warts. You tell Brian that the bumps he discovered are warts, and that the warts themselves are treatable with a topical medication, one he applies directly to the warts. Warts are caused by a virus called the human papillomavirus, or HPV, which is passed from person to person by skin-to-skin -skin contact during sex. This strain of HPV does not cause cancer but people with one strain can be exposed to other strains that cause cancer. It's important to know that HPV can remain in someone's body even after warts are treated, and that some strains of HPV can cause cancer. Brian pauses and then asks about an anal pap smear. Some of his friends have gotten one and encouraged him to read about it and ask his doctor if he should get one. 
While there is no clear medical consensus on screening for anal cancer, some experts support screening in patients who are at high risk through an anal pap smear, or APS. The APS is similar to the cervical pap smear and can detect the precursor lesion of anal cancer, anal intraepithelial neoplasia, or AIN. Anal cytology is simple to undertake and has a sensitivity and specificity comparable with cervical cytology. Undertaking APS in an individual practice requires having a system in place to manage abnormal results, including high-resolution anoscopy and treatment. You explained to Brian that there are no clear guidelines to warrant an anal pap smear and that your office is not equipped at this time to conduct the test. However, because certain strains of HPV do cause cancer, you can refer him to someone who can do the test for him if he wants. He says he'll think about it. You also explain that people who are at risk for warts are also at risk for other sexually transmitted infections. You tell Brian that it would make sense to perform a few tests today. First, you'd recommend throat and anal cultures for gonorrhea, which is done with a quick swipe of a cotton swab. Then you'd recommend a digital rectal exam to see if he has any internal warts. This would involve inserting one gloved finger in his anus to feel for bumps. It would be a good idea to run blood tests for hepatitis B, chlamydia, HIV, and herpes. How does that sound? Brian says, okay. You take throat and anal cultures and conduct the digital rectal exam, finding no evidence of internal warts. You prescribe topical treatment with Iniquimod 5% cream once daily at bedtime three times a week for 12 weeks. You advise Brian to return in one week to discuss the results of his STI testing. According to a report by the National Cancer Institute, HPV vaccination of men who have sex with men, or MSM, aged 16 to 26 years, reduces anal intraepithelial neoplasia, or AIN, a precursor lesion of anal cancer. HPV types 16 and 18 are responsible for most HPV-related cancers. Vaccine efficacy against HPV 6, 11, 16, or 18 related AIN is 50 to 75 percent and may be highest in those who are negative for these four HPV strains at the time of vaccination. You know that the best time for an individual to get vaccinated is before they have been exposed to HPV. However, someone can still receive the vaccination even if they have had prior sexual contact because they may not have been exposed to all types of HPV. Genital warts may be caused by types other than 16 and 18 and may not be malignant or premalignant in nature. You also know that MSM, particularly those who practice receptive anal intercourse without condoms, are at increased risk for HPV and HPV-related disease, including warts and cancer. And there is a 30-fold increased risk for anal HPV infection in MSM who are also HIV positive. HPV vaccination is indicated in MSM through age 26, if not vaccinated when younger, making Brian a candidate for this vaccine. You are also aware that Brian may be at high risk due to intersectional factors. Intersectionality is a perspective that overlapping or intersecting social identities affect people and how these identities influence each other. If HPV is viewed through a lens of intersectionality, more attention should be paid to how gender, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, gender identity, and socioeconomic status all work together to influence HPV knowledge, vaccination, health-seeking behaviors, screening, and incidence of HPV-related cancers. In other words, as an African-American MSM, Brian may be at elevated risk for HPV-related disease. Sexual and gender minorities, or SGMs, are a medically underserved population in the United States, span all races, ethnicities, ages, socioeconomic status, and regions of the country. 
Unfortunately, SGM individuals are more likely to encounter discrimination in society at large, as well as from their health care providers. Moreover, these individuals are more likely to remain silent about important health issues they fear may lead to stigmatization. Despite the critical need for health care in the SGM population, these barriers may contribute to avoidance or delay of seeking health care. In addition, many health care professionals lack knowledge of SGM's health needs, and some have negative attitudes toward them. During its February 2015 meeting, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, recommended nine-valent HPV vaccine as one of three HPV vaccines that can be used for routine vaccination. Additionally, in October 2016, the Food and Drug Administration and ACIP approved a two-dose regimen for nine-valent HPV for girls and boys 9 to 14 years of age. Compared with the three-dose regimen in young women 16 to 26 years of age, the two-dose regimen generates non-inferior anti-HPV 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58 antibody responses. The second dose is given at 6 or 12 months following the first dose with a plus or minus four-week window. You go on to ask Brian whether he has received the HPV vaccine, and he replies that he has not. He states, Yeah, I remember hearing about that vaccine when I was in high school, but my parents said I didn't need it. You discuss with Brian the risks and benefits of the HPV vaccine, and he says that he would like to get vaccinated. You tell him that, because of his age, he will require a three-dose series. He states, I didn't realize I would have to get multiple shots for this, but if that's what it takes to keep me from getting cancer, I'll do it. Brian gets his first shot. You conclude the visit with your standard safer sex counseling and offer Brian condoms and lube samples. Finally, you send him to the lab to have his blood drawn and to the receptionist to schedule appointments for his STI test results and second shot before leaving the Student Health Center.